but let's bring on Freestyle 101 director Frank Meyer. Frank, first of all, I this is the first time we've seen each other since. Let me see. I want to I want to feature you full screen uh, full screen here. Since uh, we talk, I mean, you were the last interview. Just I just want to get this out of the way real quick. Frank <laughs> is a producer that was at G4 TV. He did an interview, graciously did an interview for the Attack of the Doc documentary, which I so appreciate. And we did it in person, and then we didn't use any of the footage. <laughs> and, you know, we had to pivot in the way that we were making that film because it was, we, you know, did it over the pandemic. And I inter I ended up interviewing everybody over a live stream. But, Frank, thank you so much. Uh, you came out and uh, just, uh, just want to thank you for that. Well, you know what's funny about that is that was literally the last – thing that any of us did before like two days later they shut down the world so it was like right. that was not only the last interview i did but that was the last time i saw another human being for like you know a year uh so that was kind of crazy uh, so you were in so the studio when you did the interview we went in this chris's studio and we were talking about my last film which was called risen the story of shron hellraiser smith and it was a documentary about a wu-tang clan member that had a brain aneurysm and chris and i go way back because we had worked on g4 tv and attack of the show together of which this movie uh freestyle 101 that i'm talking about today is actually emanates from all those days i'll explain in a second but uh so and i also i had a subscription to film threat magazine oh back in the day like i I went, I was, so I went to my friend's uh, college in Santa Cruz, like this is probably 89 or 90. And um, they had film threat and I saw it for the first time. And I was like, this is the greatest magazine I've ever seen. I went home, got a subscription. And I had a subscription up to the end. And at one point, even Chris, when you were moving, I don't know if you remember this, but when you were moving out of the Attack of the Show offices, you had stacks of magazines. You were like, I don't know what to do with these. And I was like, I'll take them all from you right now. And he's like, all right. So I have like, I have like your, I have your archive. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. It was really, it was, with that. it was taking up space in my garage. And I remember I was just giving away because I didn't yeah. think the magazine. Was like, I just have all these old issues. And I was like, he's like, if only I knew someone, if, if only you knew. Oh my God. By, by the way, I, so I have like one of every issue of film thread ever that was printed. I'm missing like one issue. I recently bought an issue off of eBay for $150. It was a what? pack what of it? issues. It was an issue. There are less than 2000 copies of this. It has Alfred Hitchcock on the cover mm -hmm. and it was done in the eighties. And mm -hmm. we only printed 1700 copies of that. I remember cause there was a technical issue and I was like, all right, we're just going to put this out. And I had to buy it on eBay with a bulk uh, of issues. And it cost me 150 bucks to get well, that so, issue. So the connection is I was involved way back then with a magazine out of New York. This is the fanzine days. Right, right. Alan, and I was involved with the fanzine called Pop Smear out of New York. And we were doing, uh, you know, sort of pop culture and humor and, you know, just weird, weird stuff. And we would do interviews with porn stars right next to interviews with rock stars right next to cartoons and illustrations and fun stuff like that not far i mean honestly we all came from sort of the being you know a few years behind film threat but sort of influenced by that mentality and it was like that post ren and stimpy kind of era and uh mr show era and stuff and all making this weird art and then chris and i end up and by the way now it's like i'm telling alan about that now i'm just directing alan you know how chris and i know each other <laughs> and, um, so the way we go back is then we both ended up on on working for the G4 TV network and on Attack of the Show. And at some, I was the digital producer. And at some point, this is like the earliest days of podcasting. They were like, you guys need to come up with like extra web content to support these shows. And what do you have, Frank? And I was like, what if we just got rappers on the mic and talk to them about rapping and then had them rap? Rip rappity roo. <laughs> and they were like, all right. And I booked the first episode. I booked Devin the Dude and then Killer Priest and then Bus Driver and then Raz Kaz and then Sean Price, then Terminology. And then all of a sudden I was getting Cypress Hill and Wu-Tang Clan and like, bum, bum, bum. It was like getting, and then Attack of the Show, when I was getting bigger numbers doing my little dumb show and bigger bookings than they were, they started running them as bumpers on Attack of the Show. And at that point I was like, man, we should make a documentary out of this. And that's what this whole thing initially, this movie Freestyle 101 Hip Hop History was supposed to be. But then the G4 TV, this is, now we get into like what the, what Chris's documentary, Attack of the Doc, is about, because these are sort of weirdly companion pieces. Mm -hmm. that like, 
we were the web series based on attack of the show and then we all got canceled and i lost all the rights to all that stuff mm. me and my boss at the time rob juster um slowly worked out a deal to get the rights back and then while we were doing that we made another movie based on some footage we shot risen and that's the okay. one we won a film threat award for award this and uh, and so that was our first film. And then while we were making that, we got the rights back to tell the story of the history of hip hop. And that's what this movie is now. And it's and got like everyone. And know. not only that, you came to the award, this event in during the pandemic, 2021 during the pandemic. <laughs> oh yeah. Was, it was done outdoors. It was masks optional. And you had to, we did it at a drive-in. It was a makeshift drive-in on a parking lot roof. It was incredible the, because the, I, so it, it was actually one of the greatest moments of my entire life. And here's why. Oh my God. So I had just discovered that Trancers was my favorite movie of all time. Like my, <laughs> like the five, I mean, Evil Dead I 2. I love that movie. Evil Dead 2 is my favorite movie. And then probably Raising Arizona and then The Thing and then Escape from New York. But like somewhere, like right, I, I just, I, I'd somehow never seen, I'd seen the box cover a thousand times. But I'd never seen Trancers. The pandemic hit. I first got Tubi. I'm going down this like Charles Band path and all of a sudden i'm like oh my god this is the greatest b movie i've never seen how have i how, like i was obsessed with it so me and rob show up to chris's premiere and truth be told very high and um <laughs> very very high and i walk up to chris and this is just this is because chris is a movie like i'm a movie nerd but chris is like royalty movie nerd so i feel like i can walk up to chris and just talk like like there was no, he's like, how you doing the pandemic? I was like, transfers. I saw it. I love it. It's the greatest. <laughs> Why have I not? And I was wearing a transfers Jack death t-shirt. And he's like, holy shit. And this is, this is Chris casually. He goes, you know, Charles band is standing right over there. Yeah. I, yeah, he was he was a sponsor, and in fact, yeah. Woman Entertainment is a sponsor this year. They're giving us a bunch of DVDs or action figures uh, to ah. give away. But like, well, I Corona love, Zombies was nominated that year. So uh, that's, yes, that's, yes, so this is the Corona he, Zombies year. He made movies during the pandemic. Everyone was shutting down. He's he made like, movies about the pandemic, pandemic during the pandemic. Like, and he made a joke. Okay, you got to see Corona Zombies is hilarious. And that girl, oh my god, uh, what's her name? Cody. Cody Rennick. Rennick. Yeah, she won. Yeah, yeah. Oh she my, won that. Uh, she. I follow her on Instagram, and I feel like I should not <laughs> feel guilty about doing that. Um, but so yeah, no, let, that was. That was Let fun. me just tell you though that Chris, says, Chris tells me he goes, you know, Charles Band is standing right over there, and like a breathless <laughs> schoolgirl, I ran over to him. And by the way, again, like people are wearing masks. I'm not wearing a mask. Charles Band's not wearing a mask. I walk up, and this is what I, I just walk up and I go, Charles Band, uh, transfers, transfers, two, transfers, one point five, Angel City, Eliminators. There's the, 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 so many like, things to talk about, and he just goes, calm down, son, calm down, like. <laughs> My name's Charles. What's your name? Like, I'm like, I'm Frank. And he's like, all right, calm down. You're going to be all right. <laughs> he the gets only fans all the time at like horror conventions and stuff. But like, I love that Full Moon didn't, they were just like, ah, whatever. We're just going to keep making movies. And, you know, they did follow like, you know, the map because people didn't know, but it made fun of toilet paper. It made fun of wearing a mask. It made fun of like, it had zombies with masks on. Like, and they made, was, made that movie within the first like four months. I mean, it was out within six months of the pandemic. Yeah. Oh, it was within weeks of the, yeah. of the lockdown because he saw it coming. they shot the whole movie in a weekend and they used sort of like um, the movie. No one's going to remember this except for me. What's up, Tiger Lily? By, oh, of course. Uh, yeah, Woody Allen. Allen. Yeah. They take old footage and then kind of like do goofy Dub jokes. It. They did that with this Italian horror film. I forget the name of the film, but they mixed it with new footage they had of Cody, this actress, Cody Renee Cameron. She's uh, this very she dresses very provocatively. Um, in, well, well uh, hello hello yeah um she's so she's great so they did these sort of sequences with her and they did a goof on this zombie movie which is like the movie she's watching it, in was, the redubbed. it was redubbed it's redubbed we did a watch party for it she was on the watch party uh, if you if you if you look look up the film threat youtube channel just look up corona zombies and you'll find uh, a bunch of stuff and i interviewed i've interviewed charlie a bunch of times but well but, and so um, actually that the, the when we talk about like weird stuff and sort of weird um, art and relations and ways we had to pivot during the pandemic is yeah. it was sort of right before the pandemic that we got all the rights back to this footage. 
And I had like a last cut of where I had left it off in like 2015. And then we lost the rights and I just sort of didn't mess with it for a while. And then right before the pandemic, we found out like, okay, you can finally use this stuff. And I was, I was just sitting there sort of like going, oh man, I just finished cutting Risen. Like I went into Risen going like, I'm going to hire an editor. And then I ended up doing most of it myself. And I brought in other people and stuff, but it became a lot of heavy lifting. And then I, after doing this feature documentary, which was so much more work than I ever thought I would ever have to do, I was all of a sudden like, you got the rights to do this entire humongous other story. It's only telling the story of hip hop plus these other through lines. And I was like, oh, man, I just want to hire somebody. And then the pandemic happened, and I was like, time to edit this movie. Right. Well, it's also like you have so much stuff. You could turn these stories into into a, a doc, docu-series. I mean, it really is that. Tell us a, tell us about the new film. And I found the review on the Film Chart website. I was just looking for it. Um, so I'm going to share screen with that. Got a very good review here. Uh, eight out of ten for this documentary. And I'm a huge fan of music docs. So, uh, but tell, tell us about freestyle 101. Yeah. So what happened is the, the way it came out of the original stuff is that I was doing this podcast back between 2008 and 2012 or so, where I had rappers come on and talk about freestyling versus lyricism and then get on the mic and kind of do what they do. And I kind of understood that like not every rapper was necessarily a great freestyler, but I understood that like the idea of improvising was somewhere that every rapper started at. You know, when you're first starting, you're beatboxing with your friends, you're doing ciphers, you're doing battles, you're just spitballing. Before you're even an artist, you're just kind of like doing it. So that was sort of the conversation piece. And with the ones who were great at it, that were known for it, I would say, man, let me I would give you some beat choices, pick a beat and just freestyle. But if you couldn't freestyle, I'd be like, well, then just do what you do. But what I want is like a live take, you know, like once on the mic or, you know, give, give me like one take instead of like punches and stuff. And so I had a bunch of more underground artists and then it became like a more popular web series. And I had shot like a hundred some episodes and I had Mob Deep and MOP and Fat Joe and Hieroglyphs, Tech Nine, you know, The Game, just all these huge artists, Freestyle Fellowship, Bus Driver, Supernatural, all these people talking about the where they came from, how they learned to rap, who their inspirations were. And also I was talking to them almost the more that like, the way you would talk to a guitar player. Like I came up as a guitar player listening to like Eddie Van Halen. So I would read these interviews with him and they'd be all technical. And then I'd read interviews with MCs and it would be like, when did you sell crack? And like, how many times did you get shot? And I'm like, what the, how's no one asking these guys like about the artistry of what they're doing? Cause when you listen to like a really good MC, like a Nas or a Jada Kiss or a really dope freestyler when they're improvising, you're like, wow, there's a lot going on there. There's a lot of wordplay and there's just a lot of technical and rhythm stuff that like, how is this not a, a deeper conversation on a musical level? And that's what my podcast became. Then I started turning it into a documentary film and that's around the time that the network collapsed. But the idea was, let me now take some newer rappers you know like a battle rapper on on the east coast because on the east coast like battle rapping it's all about battle rapping it's like boxing like you come in you might have some writtens you've done some homework but you're also improvising but on the west coast it's totally improvisational it's like the apollo you have to come up and just go totally live or like they'll boo your ass off stage so i got really fascinated with that and like the idea of like well, what is it if you're like the best gun gunslinger in the West, like what does that get you in a record deal in the modern record industry? So the modern music industry. So I started going down this path, exploring these younger MCs, open mic Eagle on the West, Iron Solomon, the battle rapper on the East. And um, then we had this whole trip up of like having to sort of get back our footage. And then we got it back. And uh, that's what this movie is. So it's the history of freestyle rap that then leads you into these sort of plot lines about these younger artists that are influenced by it and their lives and their careers and what it means to be like super, super great craftsmen at this one specific thing. But like, what does that mean in the music industry today? And I was a guitar player. So I was always like, you know, it's like back in the day, remember, you know, Chris, you're from my era. It's like, remember in the eighties when everyone had to like do tapping and whammy bars and just be like the, you know, every band had to have, you know, every time the, 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 the guitar solo came up, it was like, Wee! that was just the thing. Like if your guitar player couldn't shred, like no one took you seriously. And then Nirvana came along and no one 
cared about that. And now I feel like that whole idea of being a guitar hero, it's sort of irrelevant. So it's almost that same conversation of like, you're the dopest thing at this one little thing that's, that maybe at, at a moment was like important and could get you a record deal. But now, like, what does it mean? Uh, we have uh, like almost 500 people watching us live right now, and we have a ton of questions. I'm going to get through as many of these as possible, um, but uh, we're running behind today. So I'll do understood. I'll try to be brief. I, I don't want to uh, filibuster. No, but, no. It's know, cool. Here we go. I'm, Here we go. I'm passionate about the, 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 the subject matter and the music, and I love this artistry. So, you know, happy well, to Snake, talk about it. Snakes and Funerals says, I remember Pop Smear. Oh, and yeah, man. Comic Boom says, regarding freestyling, social media has turned it into something that looks easy and seems to lack any skill. So not true. Is the purpose of the movie to counter this impression? Yes. Essentially, it absolutely is. It's an art form, and it's a complicated one, and it takes a really, really good, sharp mind to do it. Uh, more questions here. There's a lot, so we'll get through as many as we can. Greetings, Sir Frank from Solomon Thornton says, any advice for beginning filmmakers? What I've generally found in making movies and making music, because I also make music uh, in the rock and roll side of things, is just you should just go do what you want to do and what you figure out how to make the art you want to make and don't ask for permission uh, and then later on, as you sort of build your brand, you build your artistry and you build who you are as an artist and your voice, then you can start kind of trying to do bigger stuff and make money off it. But at first, just do what you got to do, man. Just like you, you're a filmmaker, just go make movies. Even if they're cheap, even if you make them on your iPhone, fine. Just go make them. Go make 10 of them. Just keep doing your thing. You got to become a master at your craft. Do it a thousand times. And if no one's paying for it, then do it 2000 times. Uh, and then he follows up. What's your favorite hip hop album? Oh, that's tough. Uh, boy, favorite hip hop album of all time. I might go, oh, Nation of Millions by Public Enemy. I'm a big Public Enemy guy. So let's go with Nations. It takes the Nations of Millions to hold us back by Public Enemy. I like that. Uh, do you remember that Public Image Limited uh, collab with uh, Public Enemy? I sure I do. Oh my God. I love that. That's like a, that's eighties thing. Well, and you know, yeah, it was, it, it was, uh, I think, was it through Africa Islam? It might've been through a DJ that put that all together, but, uh, yeah. Chuck, Chuck D from public enemy is the narrator of our film. And I'll tell you a quick sidebar is just that I got to go into a recording studio for two days with Chuck D where he was essentially reading my script. Wow. Uh, but you know, then giving me like, or asking for direction or giving me thoughts and stuff. And I had a line in the film that was, you know, like I said something about like, and then they returned, th these two MCs returned to the scene of the crime. And Chuck was like, what if we said the scene of the rhyme? And I was like, <laughs> oh, that's a way better line. So I was like, yeah, scratch that. Yes, sir. Put that in. Thank you, Chuck. <laughs> roll, roll tape immediately. <laughs> uh, Spidey Sensei is 72. Uh, just a comment here. It says, sounds like uh, you'd be a good fit for Math Hoffa's show if he's interested in East Coast battle rappers. And then Jeremiah M responds, there is a community of shredders on YouTube. They get millions of views, says oh, Jeremiah yeah. M. So I mean, there's no bigger fan. Look, like I said, I, I am a guitar player who came up during the shredding era. Like, I mean, I, I fancy myself a bit of a shredder myself. Uh, <laughs> what I'm saying is like, I understand the artistry, but also as a guy that loves that technical expertise in both guitar playing and as a fan in hip hop, because I'm not an MC myself. Um, I also, though, in the modern industry, just kind of go like, well, other than you know, those YouTube views, like in the world of selling records in this Taylor Swift, Ice Spice sort of world of pop hits, like, is it, you know, how much does that matter? How do you monetize that? You know what I mean? Like, and and the, and, and the, these are questions I'm just raising. I'm not pat, casting judgment on like new hip hop or anything. I'm just sort of going like, hey man, look at these dope artists and like, here's where they're at struggling in their careers. At least, you know, when I made the movie, like, what do you think it means? Uh, hey, it's me in HD asks of all the legends of hip hop, which one was your favorite to interview? Oh, to be a fly on the wall. Well, 
I'm a huge Ice T fan, and so that was incredible. And also just getting to hear him do like a, a one take off the cuff gangster rap freestyle. And we had Joe Lynch, the horror movie director. Joe yeah, we Lynch, just had him out last week. We yeah, yeah. So of Su- Joe Lynch directed Suitable Flesh. He's my DP on most of the movie. So me and Joe Lynch were in the booth shooting Ice T, just doing like a impromptu gangster rap and like we later were like that was like watching miles davis blow trumpet like that was crazy (laughs) but i will say that my favorite was we had a guy on and rest in peace named sean price he was in a group called helter skelter and he was an incredible mc and just the coolest funniest guy there was only a couple guys that we had on multiple times and he was one of them because like I was already a fan and then I met him and I just thought he was the, he, where there was a Gibson guitar sitting there and he grabbed it and he played a G chord and he went February, March, April, May, I'll be Sean till November, Sean till November. And he started singing, you know, gone till November, but putting in Sean and did a whole impromptu concert. And we were, I was like, roll tape, roll tape, roll tape. Like, you know what I mean? Like he was such a cool, funny guy. And then when we went out to New York, he like was, you know, he hooked me up with Prodigy from Mob Deep and we ended up rolling in Mob Deep studio. Prodigy from Mob Deep gave us his studio for two days. She's like, yeah, man, I've already paid for the time. You've got my studio. We and Then all of a sudden I had Ice-T and Wu-Tang Clan in Mob Deep studio. That shit was crazy, man. Uh, some questions. We're live on Rumble right now. I don't know how many people are watching, but we have uh, questions from Rumble. Here's a good one here from A. Dallas 24. Mm-hmm. Frank interviewed Dell the Funky Homo Sapien so why does he think his unique style is loved in the UK, but underappreciated in the United States? Deltron 3030 is a seminal hip hop record that deserves more love. I completely agree with you. Uh, Del is an incredible artist and I've interviewed him a few different times and he raps on the podcast. He's not, his rap isn't in the movie, but his interview is, um, I think that there's a few guys like Dell and Cool Keith and some of those more technical rappers that that like don't quite get the appreciation. They get the underground appreciation, MF Doom, you know, um, here in the United States, but they don't sell as many records. Whereas, you know, Europe is a you, I play in a rock and roll band where like we do way better in Europe and we tour Europe all the time because like we do better in Europe. Our kind of music is more appreciated. We sell more merch on the road. We do bigger places in Europe. So I understand that there's a lot of hip hop artists, MOP, Onyx, a lot of guys I know, you know, Raz Kaz, like these guys go to Europe and tour because there's a better market there. So I think with guys like Dell and some of those more technical rappers, like it's because they can make better money because those people love and worship what they do and see it more as an art form and not just like, oh, you were on that gorilla single and now I don't care. Whereas in Europe, like they're like, you are an artist with a revered catalog who deserves to be treated like such. You know what I'm saying? Um, uh, by the way, if you just look at the live chat, everyone's just talking about hip hop and favorite hip hop artists. They're not, they're, I mean, people are asking questions, but they're like, they're having their own discussion outside of our discussion. That's what I, about, that's what I love about hip hop. And that's what I, what I right. wanted this movie to spark that conversation. Cause there's so many great artists talking about this art form. So if you like it, you're like, Oh my God, it just, it just, you know, gets your mind really. Uh, another question from Aid Ellis 24 uh, on Rumble says, outside of New York City, Atlanta, and Los Angeles, where were the unexpected places that some of the best freestylers are coming from? Any places outside the United States uh, with a decent battle rap scene like Toronto, London, or Paris? I honestly can't. Uh, tell you that I'm aware of there being any great freestyle scenes outside of the United States. And I'm not saying that there aren't, I'm just saying I'm not aware of it. So I don't want to comment on it. Um, I would say in my opinion, LA, as far as real impromptu, pure freestyling, not talking about battling or talking about battling. If you're only talking about impromptu and not written at all, or not punchlines that are pre done, I think LA is hands down the best, but Houston is an underrated scene for freestyling. Houston's got some monsters and Houston's got some monster MCs. Houston kind of sometimes gets lumped in with like the more basic kind of car culture and a lot of the, like the more 
uh, sort of pop rap, but there's MCs like K Reno and the South Park Coalition, you know, obviously guys like Scarface, although that's more old school, but there, there's some like real monster MCs out of Houston. Um, so I don't know. I would say Houston is the underrated scene for me. And uh, let's see a uh, final question here. We have comic boom says, can Mr. Meyer freestyle rap his pitch for moviegoers to see freestyle one one no, sir, I cannot, uh, because it would be it would be disrespectful to the culture for me as a sort of fly on the wall filmmaker to try to sort of pretend uh, that I'm, you know, that I can do this as an art form. Uh, so if I had a guitar, I could give you like a tasty guitar lick version. What I can tell you is that if you like freestyle rap and and battle rap and 90s hip hop golden era rap and there's some modern rappers in this as well like i said open mike eagle iron solomon stuff but it, i would say the majority of this is what i would call the golden era boom bap if you like that stuff you know we have these incredible artists and we have guys who are known for freestyling like gift of gab and dell who we talked about and the guys you know mike and nine and then we have these incredible lyricists guys like sean price and raz kaz and you know it's kind of amazing to me to hear inside baseball conversations with these artists. Cause like I said, I feel like a lot of times they don't sometimes get taken seriously um, in terms of like the, the details of, of the art form they do. So I felt like when you, when you had that conversation, everyone opened up and you got these really, really cool, awesome, candid moments with these guys who were suddenly just enthusiastic. Cause they were like telling you about their favorite thing in the world, not necessarily the record career, not their new single, just the favorite thing in the world, which is hip hop, which is why they're there in the first, that's why they are a, a star. You know what I mean? And uh, final question for me, where can people see Freestyle 101 hip hop history? Well, thanks for asking. And I'll tell you this. Uh, now we are, we are on Amazon Prime. We are on uh, Google Play. We are on YouTube movies. You can go to freestyle101movie.com and we're on all the social medias. And uh, yeah, so we're out there now. And if you like it and you watch it on Amazon, we would appreciate if you leave a review in this world of going out digitally, like anytime someone you know, watches your movie, pays a few bucks for your movie or leaves a review or gives it a few stars, it really does actually like count and kind of helps the whole process along. So we, we appreciate that. Uh, and honestly, I think if you guys, if you love hip hop, you're just going to love this movie. It's, it's fun. Well, it's a wild I mean, ride. To the website, Freestyle 101. This looks amazing. Dude, their website looks incredible. Watch yeah, on Amazon rock. and YouTube movies. Rob Juster, man. You know Rob Juster doesn't mess around. That's my yes, producer, know, my boss from back in the day. And, you know, he, he knows what he's doing. Oh, my God. This looks fantastic. Uh, yeah, all right. Fat, you got Fat Joe. You got Rizza. I mean, it got everybody. That's Sean Kingston from Beautiful Girls. Of That's Pete Rock. Master Ace. Sorry, that's Razkaz. Pete Rock's also in it. That was Master Ace. That's Dell. That's A+. Sean Price playing the guitar. Everything nice. you need there, man. Shit. Be, be real. <laughs> uh, Shit. <laughs> Frank, thank you so much. I mean, not just, you know, for coming out to talk about your movie, but just, you know, for participating in the attack of the doc film. We're talking about doing a watch party sometime before the end Ooh, of the year. I would like to be involved in that. Yeah. Like, uh, yeah. Joe Lynch will come back. We got other people We're it's just going to be a bunch of XG4 people just like talking, you know, through, we'll talk over the documentary and narrate it but uh, i'll let you know when we're going to do that you but, realize uh, you realize that there, there could be some really really raw there's p rock there's some really raw stuff could be said during that like that you might you might oh, you know you might want to have a, a time delay on that oh i don't care uh, weird there definitely be some raw stuff because you guys all did the interview you know not knowing like what was happening at g4 and how things turned out i i hope that the doc my my documentary is like a, a little time capsule of that era. It kind of just captures the spirit of it. It gives you a taste of what was happening behind the scenes at what it meant to, to a lot of people. So yeah, but dude, I just so great to see you like balance this career of like, I'm this incredibly talented musician. Oh, and by the way, I make documentaries on the mm -hmm. side about uh, music. Thank you. thank you, man. Appreciate it. And yeah. I appreciate, I appreciate you guys, you guys support. And like I said, I mean, I'm a, I'm a film threat uh, fan from back, you know, when I when I first really became 
obsessed with movies and I'm still obsessed with movies. I'm going to see Suitable Flesh, Joe Lynch's movie, in the theaters tomorrow in North nice. Hollywood uh, because I love seeing movies in the theaters. And uh, and I've also been on a Sam Raimi kick and I've been watching all of like the behind the scenes and the making ofs and all the like I'm just a movie nerd like you guys are. So like I'm that dude who like wakes up in the morning, and my wife gets up to work and I like watch two hours of like Evil Dead 2, like unreleased, <laughs> you know, outtakes. And I just yeah, sit there oh, and go, yeah. oh, my God, that's so incredible, you know. And then my wife walks in and goes like, what, what, what is happening? <laughs> Bruce Campbell was so abused by Sam Raimi in those films. I mean, in a good way. I mean, it was so entertaining. Dude, but, but also seeing just how the creative they were with the shots and how much, how so much of what you, it was based on like practical, you know, like magician. All practical. Like, yeah. It's like it's just, some stop motion animation. Yeah. There's some stop motion, but like a lot of the stuff, even like the, I was just watching this thing where like, you know, when the girl is dragged along the floor by the vines. <laughs> And like they they put her on a board and then underneath were just running a sheet of of like you know what the ground was, meaning like they mm -hmm. instead of dragging her, they just like had the ground doing the work right. and rose her above it. I'm like, oh my god, that's some like old school, you know what I mean? That's like old school movie magic stuff. Well, Sam Raimi's the one who he he kind of um I don't know that he invented it, but he created this process. He really wanted to get like a steady cam, but he couldn't afford it. So, well, he, so he did like the, the trash can it's, cam it's, and all it's that called, stuff. He called it the shaky cam. Yeah, yeah. It was effectively a two by four. So you get a two by four. You put the camera in the center, which acts as like the balance, the two by four, right? And he rode a bicycle. So he's riding a bicycle with a two by four, but the camera's in the center and that center is balanced. So it's not as shaky because you're trying to balance the, the two by four. And he had people run with it. He uh, used a bicycle like... He interviewed I, a lot of stuff. I read an interview with Bruce Campbell where he talked about that. And by Evil Dead 2, for some of those shots where the camera burst through the glass, it's what you're talking about. But they put these two metal poles in front of the camera and then this really thin glass. So those yeah. shots, they're actually breaking. Like there's two poles underneath the shot you're not seeing that are breaking the glass for the camera to go through. Isn't that bananas? Like that whole time, I just assumed that somehow was done in post. But like, no, that's a thin sheet of glass, and there's two metal prongs bursting the glass for the camera to go through. Like that's bananas. Yeah, I, it's 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 amazing when you see a filmmaker that you know begins in the indie film world, and you've got no money, and you have to come up with creative ways to get to, to get to get something on screen, and then suddenly you have all the money in the world. Because uh, we were talking about Marvel before you came on, and it's like all the money in the world is is not a solve for creativity. You no. have to cr be creative, and when you have a lot of money, sometimes for a small indie filmmaker, can actually be a hindrance, right? Right. Like, and, but wouldn't you agree though that isn't Doctor Strange the last most recent one? It's Evil Dead Four, right? Right. Yeah. I mean, at the end, kind there, of. I mean, but I mean, like, there's a doppelganger, the car, there's a vortex, yeah. there's essentially a book of blood. I mean, there's every there, there's there's uh, Bruce Campbell fighting his own hand. Right. I mean, like it's Evil Dead Four. When I watched that, I was like, okay, finally Sam Raimi basically got a Marvel MCU <laughs> level budget. And what did he do? He basically made an Evil Dead Army of Darkness. <laughs> basically, I mean, it's in the context of being right, right. Doctor Strange. But if you look at the tent poles of what a, an Evil Dead movie is of that franchise. That movie hits every single one of them. Yeah, it's crazy. There's chase scenes, there's cameras, th he fights himself, the cars in the cars fly. I mean, everything. It's, it's all, all the, it. it's it's all the things that Sam Raimi likes, including yeah, his his beloved car. So his beloved car. <laughs> yeah. Hey, uh, congratulations again. Um, come back when you have another movie, and uh, I'll see you for the watch party. And it's great. It's uh, it's uh, I really love when people like um, like, you know, from it's weird, like people from G4 going off and making indie films. Why does that not surprise me? Yeah, man. If, you, if you do a suitable flesh watch party, put me in on that, too. I'm, I'm oh, a Joe, for sure. I, I'm a Joe Lynch guy. That's my dude. I love Joe Lynch. Yeah, I don't man. know that we could. I don't know that we could do that because of the nudity. Oh, so not, we're not yeah, showing oh, it. I'm, I'm seeing it tomorrow night. Don't tell me any. Don't I don't want any reveal. Okay, I know there's nudity. I assume if that's you're, it has the word flesh in the title, but if 
you're a fan of Heather Graham, you're going to see um, it. Well, I sure am. <laughs> I sure uh, am. Uh, Frank, thank you so much. Uh, <laughs> Thanks, appreciate you dropping by the show. Uh, see you next time, man. Yeah, uh, man. Take care.